from there, and we were doing a history lesson. And it occurred to me, listening to you right now, that a few of the things that I was saying yesterday and today would be of value to us here. If you <coughs> walk east of Broad Street and you head up the church hill, you can go to St. John's Church, and you can sit in the same seats where Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and Patrick Henry sat when they planned the revolution. And these are real men. Real mistakes, and they had some good ideas all mixed in together. Thomas Jefferson is a classic example. He was an interesting man who made real mistakes. One of the interesting things Jefferson did was he designed his own tombstone. Out of all the things he'd done in his life, he picked three things to put on that tombstone. Does anybody know what they were? He founded the University of Virginia because he knew that a democracy only works if you had an educated population. Otherwise, it's mob rule, right? And it has to be a free university in order for everyone to have access to it. He wrote the Declaration of Independence. What's originally included in any slavery clause? They took it out. They made him take it out. They also took out the part about you being able to vote no matter what religion you were. So he followed that up with the Virginia Statute for Religion. So he didn't put on his tombstone that he was president of the United States, right? He put on three things, free education and the power of the written word. So I encourage you to incorporate into everything that you're doing the written word, right? Take advantage of the newspaper, take advantage of every opportunity you have to write down your ideas and make them public. Okay? I also pointed out another landmark for revolution right over here at uh, 919 West Franklin, the Crenshaw House, which is now the Center for Public Policy at VCU, the home of the Wilder School of Leadership. Right? <laughs> uh, in 1909, a group of 19 women met there right, at the invitation of Anne Clay Crenshaw, and they founded the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia, which was the most powerful force giving <laughs> women the right to vote. Right? They met and I just stress that women were not given the right to vote. Rights are rarely given, right? They're asked for and taken. And those women worked together. There were some people in the equal suffrage movement who were racist and thought it should just be the vote for white women. But those voices were overruled because there was an understanding that the only way to achieve the right was to work together. So I encourage you to remember that to work together with all the different groups that are seeking these changes. And the third thing I think that's important that we get out of that is those women met in 1909, when did women finally get a constitutional amendment given them right to vote? 1920. So for 11 years they worked. I'm not suggesting that you occupy the UCU in for 11 years, but that we remember this significant change takes time. And that we be in it for the long haul. Thank you. said uh, it's not the previous generation that you're fighting and uh, that is certainly true but I think we need to uh, broaden the scope beyond that and realize that there is a history of oppression here it's not just the present factors that are causing problems it's not just the decisions made by the Bush administration or the Obama administration yeah fuck it I'll just yell The system started off with its own set of problems, and it's been a gradual decline from there. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check.
Our oppression did not start 50 years ago. Our oppression did not start 50 years ago. It did not start 100 years ago. It did not start 100 years ago. For some of us, for some of our ancestors, it started thousands of years ago. For some of our ancestors, it started thousands of years ago. There are some root problems in society, in civilization. There are some root problems in society, in civilization. I think we can all agree that capitalism exacerbates those. I think we can all agree that capitalism exacerbates those. There is a breadth of history to be examined. There is a breadth of history to be examined. In the length of oppression. In the length of oppression. Of who is being oppressed. Of who is being oppressed. And who the oppressors were. And who the oppressors were. If we wish to be successful in making any change, if we wish, wish to be successful in making any change, we must examine all of those things. We must examine all of those things. We must also examine. We must also examine the history of resistance. The history of resistance, of resistance that accompanies that oppression. That accompanies that oppression. There have been many failures and successes. There have been many failures and successes by revolutionary leaders. By revolutionary leaders. And we must not, must not let their lessons <laughs> go unlearned. Go unlearned. I really urge all of you. I really urge all of you to take into account what is going on now. Take into account what is going on now with resistance in Greece. With resistance in Greece. The Arab Spring. The Arab Spring. Other student movements across the world. Other student movements across the world. Other social movements across the world. Other social movements across the world. Because while students are a powerful force, while while students are a powerful force, they are not solely the 99%. They are not solely the 99%. And in organizing Occupy Richmond, we must take that closely into account. And in organizing Occupy Richmond, we must take that closely into account. I really want to call out. I really want to call out just a few things that I've observed. Just a few things that I've observed in the very short lifespan of Occupy Richmond. In the very short lifespan of Occupy Richmond. Thus far. Thus far. There are a lot of people out here. There are a lot of people out here who are really motivated. Who are really motivated. Who really want to enact change. Who really want to enact change. And some people have some really fucking great ideas. And some people have some really fucking great ideas. Yeah. However, However, you need to be careful. You need to be careful about how those ideas, about how those ideas, are, ideas are put into play. Are put into play. And how they affect and individuals. They affect. What percent? Individuals. Individuals. And not the group. And not the group. There are people who want to occupy Richmond. There are people who want to occupy Richmond that will be at greater risk. That will be at greater risk of any action that we take. Of any action that we take. There are people who want to participate. There are people who want to participate who, for their lack of resources, for their lack of resources, or their lack of ability, or their lack of ability, or dire prior engagements. And they will not be able to attend. They will not be able to attend. And we must accurately, and we must accurately represent all of those people. Represent all of those people. I am talking. I am talking about the issues about the issues of race, of race, class, class, age, age, gender, gender, sex, sex. Education. Education. All of these things. All of these things. Direct the levels of oppression. Direct the levels of oppression that people experience. That people experience through the concept of privilege. Through the concept of privilege. Some of you may understand what I mean when I say privilege. Some of you may understand what I mean when I say privilege. But I will define it. But I will define it. Privilege. Privilege is more or less 
access to institutional power. Is more or less access to institutional power. For example, for example, I, I am a white male. Am a white man. I have a lot more institutional power. I have a lot more institutional power than a queer person of color. Than a queer person of color. Than someone, someone who is disabled. Someone who is disabled. And I have to recognize those things. And I have to recognize those things. And not exert any more power. Not exert any more power. Than is respectful to those other people. One thing that was brought up yesterday. One thing that was brought up yesterday was the idea of progressive stack keeping. Was the idea of progressive stack keeping. Now, when we have an assembly, when we have an assembly, there's going to be a certain demographic mix. I was really pleased to see yesterday the diversity of the crowd. However, there was a large student white contingent. And also a large male contingent within that. We brought forth the idea of progressive stack keeping. Which, in and of itself, is the idea that when people want to talk, we keep a list of everyone who's raised their hand, right? And from there, we go through the list, get everyone's opinions out. But if we see that it's largely, you know, white males getting up and talking the majority of the time, then we're going to say, well, we need to reevaluate who is getting the most voice here. And we need to bump the people up who are not being heard equally. Whether or not they are equally represented in the physical aspect in that assembly. Some people seem to have sort of a problem with this and took it very personally. They were addressing the idea that if this is an egalitarian, then why are we favoring some people over others? I will say that we do not live in an egalitarian society, and so we cannot be so idealistic as to just cast aside the social constructs that cause a lot of iniquity. We must address them in not a way that the institution would, but one that effectively counteracts it by recognizing Within this occupation, I hope to see a plethora of anti-oppression and anti-racist training and education going on. And that will go on in the form of workshops, in the form of literature, resources, but also it's going to go on with us talking to each other and creating a community within ourselves. We do not want to be divisive. We must focus on points of unity. <laughs> we must also focus, must also also focus, focus on, our common struggles on our common struggles that are bringing us together, bringing us together while, taking into account while taking into account people's different personal struggles, people's different personal struggles what their needs are, what their needs are as, opposed to our own. as opposed to our own. And I think that's about all I have to say, actually. Can I just ask that people, like, scoot in together? There aren't really too many people. I mean, if, if you want, obviously. We don't, I don't think, I personally don't think there's need for a people's night with this, this number of people. So if we could get super close.
such as Goldman Sachs, KKR, and the rest. Uh, also, the, the, uh, the banks have also been given, these are the banks that were too big to fail. We need to focus our questions. The other speakers have talked about uh, ideas. We're, we're too scattered. We need, as a people, and I think one of the other uh, uh, previous speakers made a very important point, and that is that we're not represented by Republicans or Democrats. We should have citizen, citizen representatives. And it should be a pure democracy in that we come in, say, you or I or anyone can come in for a length of term. That means that we, 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 we have no special interest. We get rid of the K Street lobbyists who have sold us out. We need, as a country of laws, we traveled, my husband and I have traveled the world over. And what, what we understand now, and we always have, is that this is a great country, and it's a country of laws. We have laws in the books, and as people, we have to be responsible and make those law work. We have to make these people accountable. Why is it, in, in, I don't know whether you remember, in 2007, I think there was $32 billion, and I may not have these figures right, that were given out in bonuses to Wall Street. This is the year right before, well actually after in 2008, when we had the collapse of uh, the mortgage uh, industry, the banking industry that were too, la too big to fail. Why haven't any of these people been brought to, to, to justice? Why haven't they been, why haven't they faced the trial? Yes. And that's why we, as people, and this, again, this is what I've noticed in third world countries, is that they sort of sleepwalk through their country. They act as if they're, it's not their country. This is our country. Let's take charge. Yeah! Let's, let's make these people accountable. We also have to hold accountable the accounting firms that gave all of these firms a healthy balance sheet, when in fact they had stolen from us. Our, for, our 401k is a parent as a mother, as a wife, uh, we have to continue working. My husband is, is not a, a, you know, he's not in good health, but we have to continue this. We have to support our children who can't find jobs. Um, like for instance, one of these companies, I won't mention which one because I, I have a personal knowledge of, has purchased one of the food companies. And a lot of these equity firms have purchased a lot of these companies. And basically what they've done is they've stripped the assets of these companies. These companies now will send uh, our manufacturing companies overseas so that there will be no jobs for you. I mean, I look at you and I'm really <laughs> quite worried about you as, as my own children. There's nothing out there. You can have service jobs which will, number one, have no benefits. There's no retirement. So we need to make people accountable. We're not focused. We're, we're, we're as I say, as a group, we're not focused. Nowhere of uh, the stories that I've heard on any of the, uh, the uh, airwaves have talked about a united message. And that is, we need to make these institutions work. And we need, I don't think that either party addresses our needs right now. I heard Herman Cain saying the other day that if you don't have a job and you're not rich, it's your own fault. I don't agree with that. I think that opportunities have left this country. They're no longer here, uh, and and that's and that is the sad truth. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Good. I just want to thank you guys for all coming out. Um, I just want to make a couple. I just have a couple things I want to emphasize. 
just from an inside point of view, what I've been going through, what my parents are going through, I'll be as brief as possible. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm currently uh, employed by the government. I work on a government facility under a student program. And I spent the entire summer upset and distraught. Why? Because word got out that a bill was being passed that made me get, just cancel out the student program for student workers who want to work in government facilities. I thought that by the beginning of the fall semester, I would be an unemployed student. I had parents who work full-time jobs, just like everyone else. I, I have no one here with me, but my, my family is, are spread out across the country. I'm a full-time student and I work, I don't work full-time, I work as many hours as I can, 20 to 30 hours a week. And I just have enough to pay my, my student bill, my everything else. My parents help me whenever they can, but they can only do so much. And luckily, uh, by some divine intervention, I still have a job, but I have no idea when that's going to change. Um, I see something wrong with that. My employers told me that I either, if the bill got passed or not, they didn't know. They said that the only way I would be insured to keep my job is if I quit school and become full-time employee. Now, that sounds like I'm being punished for getting my education. Something's wrong with that. Um, my, my, our, your parents, my parents, no longer guaranteed their social security. They don't know what's waiting for them. And God forbid what's gonna be down the road, what we're gonna have waiting for us. Like like you just said a minute ago, you, the, our elderly have to work full-time positions just like we do. They have paid their dues just like we're paying our dues now. And yet they have to work harder than they need to in this country. Not just in this country, but globally. I have to go worse for this. Yeah. I mean, just the, our senior citizens should not have to bust their asses to just have the necessities. Period. The end. Woo. Um, Woo. You know, I think people are going to call, people call this movement unorganized, unled, chaotic just random, <laughs> foolish kids, spoiled, lazy, who just want to be part of a trend. And I think that is complete BS. I think, I'm not going to say what I think, because it's not going to be friendly. <laughs> I think that we are the representation of this nation's discontent, dissatisfaction, and just downright just the anger. There is something, it's not, nothing has been wrong for the past 10 years, the past 20 years. Something has been wrong for a very long time, a very long time, more, just longer than I, than more of us care to think about. And something we've been promised to change constantly, we have emailed our state legislators, our congressmen, our delegates, and we, we have voted, we have spoken personally to our political officials, and yet nothing, absolutely nothing. And so people wonder why we're gathering and forming these this, this, why is this movement happening? It's because nothing else thus far has worked. I don't think there's anything clearer than that. What we're doing right now is the most American thing that I've ever seen. And if there's something wrong with being American, uh, I think you need to check yourself. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I just have a small thing I'd like to read out, where I stand at least, and it's pretty much the same thing, louder. I think. You can use the megaphone for five more minutes. Oh yeah? Okay. Does it work? Hello? There you go. There used to be a time in this country when the more you gave away, the more powerful person you became. And the decisions were based Oh, sorry. The more, yes, sorry. And the decisions were based on the repercussions of seven generations later. When the powerful really cared about their people, they were the American Indians. And is there any American Indians in this group right now? Excellent. One, two. Two American Indians. Isn't that funny? Here we are in a state that used to be filled with American Indians, and we only have two in this crowd fighting for our freedom. That's okay. We're all brothers and sisters. Exactly. It's time now for change. 
now that our government is tied into big business in this corrupted capitalistic six society. It's no longer about the people but money, power, profit, control, etc., etc. It goes on. There needs to be a cap to capitalism where excessive money is put back into the pool for the benefit of the people and the preservation of this amazing planet we are all given. We need to join together as one. We need to take back our God-given freedoms we should all have throughout this world. Big business government should be made accountable for their actions. Higher taxes to those polluting our environment with no loopholes. No free checks in the mail for those who do not work, but put them to work in community service. Sis. Mandatory flat tax of 15% to all citizens and non-citizens. It's time now for a non-violent revolution of evolutionary mind consciousness to move forward out of greed for the benefit of all rather than the 1%. Down with corrupted capitalism at its peaks of insanity and up with a new socialistic spiritualism for the people by the people. Thank you.